Good morning, folks. Who wants to uh, build some data pipelines? So myself, I'm Pramod uh, Gupta. I work for Northern Trust uh, for five years now. I did not start as a data engineer. I need to tell you that. Uh, so uh, I started my career as a telecommunication engineer and then got to the software engineering, then came to the data engineering and never looked back. Uh, data engineering is my passion now, uh, but I do like to apply some of the principles I learned uh, in the telecom world, how reliability is so important. Otherwise, uh, you will be uh, calling 911 and getting a busy dial tone. And uh, in software engineering, how they have adopted to the cloud uh, very well. Data engineering is still struggling. So try to bring those principles to the data engineering part. Now, data pipeline, uh, it's getting a pretty uh, generic term uh, like uh, previous terms, data mesh. Uh, who knows about data mesh? I'm, I'm still trying to figure out. Uh, I, I hope Zamak is not here, otherwise she will beat me up. Uh, but uh, data pipeline is a generic term, and we will talk about it a little bit. Um, and I, I'll try to uh, try to keep part. Uh, hopefully, we don't need all the time. Uh, some of the slides are dense. Uh, the goal is to give you an overview of what's possible. Um, and if you can, uh, if 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 there is something for you to take away uh, from it is. To know that if, if you thought it is difficult, uh, hopefully it will feel a little bit uh, simpler. All right. So this is what we're going to cover. Um, but uh, let's uh, talk about uh, uh, Northern Trust for a moment. It's a bank. It's it's a um, over 130 years old bank. Uh, they they became famous uh, during the famous Chicago fire. Everybody uh, ran away, Every a lot of bankers ran away with the money. I'm paraphrasing the story a little bit. Uh, but uh, the founder of Northern Trust stuck around and gave back what he could so that city can be rebuilt. Uh, so that's uh, the original story. They do a lot of things. Uh, there is a portion of that where we offer services to other financial institutions. So sometimes we call Northern Trust, uh, you know, bank of other banks. So that's the part we work in. And uh, as part of uh, um, that part of the Northern Trust Bank, uh, we recently built a new product for our clients and we call it Data Warehouse Solutions. Uh, yeah, it's not a very fancy name, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain it like this. Some of our clients are saying, hey, you know, everybody is building a warehouse to do, um, you know, reporting, uh, insights, AI, ML, we don't want to build one. We don't have ability to build one. Can you build one for us? So that's where we come in. We offer that as a service. We build warehouses for our client. There is a team build warehouses for Northern Trust. I am not that one. Um, we build warehouses for uh, our clients. So the challenge with that is if we are building for each client, uh, we can, of course, build one and give it to all the clients, that doesn't work. Our client come to us because we provide them highly customized service. Uh, so we build a warehouse that appears custom to their needs, meets their needs. But we also know building a warehouse is not a trivial work. If we build one custom warehouse for each client, we will never make any money. So we built a platform that allows us to rapidly create warehouses by changing the metadata. So heavily metadata driven warehouse building platform. There are vendors out there in the booth who also do this. So it's not that, uh, you know, everybody needs to do this from scratch. Uh, we had to do this from, from scratch uh, because uh, otherwise we won't be able to provide the value our clients are looking for. Uh, some of the things you're going to see there will resonate with uh, uh, some of the presentations you may have seen elsewhere or maybe in a booth. So there are third-party uh, off-the-shelf components available to do this. Uh, when you do uh, with those off-the-shelf component, you get what you have in those off-the-shelf component. You cannot customize it. We wanted to control uh, what features we're going to put in, how we're going to scale it, and so on. So we had to build it from scratch. All right, uh, this would not have been possible be uh, without the leadership of uh, some of uh, the folks mentioned here. So I do have to recognize that. And uh, the one on the bottom, uh, they are the men in the trenches. Uh, I, I love working with them uh, uh, every day. And uh, 
you know, that's that's a fantastic team. Uh, a technology is only as good as the people behind it. Uh, you can buy the most expensive, uh, uh, really well done technology, but if you don't have right right set of people working with it, and this applies to Snowflake, uh, I'm sure there are other uh, 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 platforms out there which do things similar to that. But try creating a support ticket for those other platform and see when you get the response compared to Snowflake. One story I have to tell: I was signing off. It was past midnight, uh, uh, Chicago time, and I found something and I saw. I, I thought maybe before I forget, let me uh, create the ticket and put all the details because by morning I'm getting old, I'll forget. Uh, so I put the ticket and I thought, all right, uh, by uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon, I will have a response. I brush my teeth and I just take a last peek at my phone and the response was already there. That's the kind of support you get. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, the that support came from, uh, I think the European desk uh, of Snowflake. So definitely uh, don't get too hyped up by some of the cool technologies. Also look for uh, people. That's the message I'm trying to uh, get across. People behind it. All right, let's talk pipeline. So this is the simplistic way I can describe. Uh, too complex, uh, you know, my brain starts to hurt. So uh, I like simple diagrams, sim simple, comp uh, yeah, you know, sim simple concepts. But if you have questions, we can definitely dive deeper into all the complexity. You take the data from a source, you run a set of rules, transformation, whatever you want to call it, and then you get the data in a shape you would like to store into the destination. And you can repeat again and again and again. Um, now, that, in my opinion, is a s simplistic representation of data pipeline. The magic is in that task sitting in the middle. That gives you the ability to repeat your logic that you wrote over several days, several hours, several months, perfected it, it works, and you don't want to uh, redo that work again and again. So if you can make it repeatable, you effectively have a pipeline. If you're writing that logic every time, in my book, it is not a pipeline yet. You are, uh, you are writing it every time, every single time. Pipeline should allow you to reproduce the same result if you send the same input and every time without requiring you to uh, tweak it in, uh, uh, again and again. And I, the analogy I give is when you imagine a car assembly line, every person on the line knows what to do, as long as they do their job right, the end product is expected to be of good quality. You are not testing every single car produced out of that line by looking inside uh, every single component. You have checked the pipeline that every person, the person putting the steering wheel is doing it right. Since you have checked that, you know the quality of the car will be right. So that's uh, what we do with the data pipelines. As long as we have tested every step of the pipeline, the results should be predictable. All right, so in the traditional approach, how many folks are comfortable with the merge uh, statement in SQL, uh, in uh, Snowflake? So traditionally, um, and, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm around for some time, so some of the folks might, uh, uh, might find this uh, statement surprising. Merge statement didn't exist before you needed to do uh, a begin transaction, uh, uh, you know, probably delete and insert uh, or update and insert uh, by checking what is uh, there already in the destination. Merge statements uh, made it much more simpler. Now, if you are building a pipeline, you will most likely deal with the merge statements, especially in uh, uh, Snowflake, because uh, when we are doing task and stream, how many folks are familiar with uh, streams and tasks or using streams with tasks. So uh, the way I will explain for the rest of the folks uh, is if your source is changing, you don't want to read the source all the time completely. You want to read the changed portion of that. Uh, also referred to as CDC in other places. Stream gives you that ability, right? So if somebody added a row, updated a row, that row will show up in the stream. Task is like a scheduler for you. 
uh, you can schedule uh, an operation and you put those two together, you b get a building block for your data pipeline. Now the task does come with a certain uh, uh, limitation. You can execute only one SQL statement. All right, so if, if you are working with one merge statement, you can execute that. If you need to execute multiple merge statements, anybody want to shout out a guess? What will you do? Stored procedure. And the stored procedures, uh, now it is available in SQL, uh, can be uh, intimidating in, uh, or used to be intimidating because it was in JavaScript. Well, I can attest to that. I wasn't a JavaScript programmer and Snowflake made me a JavaScript programmer. It is not that difficult. You don't have to learn the entire JavaScript. If you have done a little bit of programming anywhere, it will come naturally. There are four, maybe five methods you're going to call uh, in JavaScript. Otherwise, the pattern repeats again and again. All right. Uh, what's the tip? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, avoid temporary table when using uh, uh, stream. So he, stream is a little bit magical, right? You read the stream, you see the change. And then you do your work of moving that data into the destination. You go back and read the stream, it's gone, poof. What happened? So uh, some of the folks already understand that part, but under the cover, what it is doing is when you read the stream, it will give you the data. The moment a transaction implicitly or explicitly is committed, the stream wipes out. It's a kind of a pointer. There is no real data in there. The pointer moves forward. And when you go back and query the stream, there is no more data until some new changes happen uh, to the source. So if you do the traditional way, oh, I have multiple steps in my data transformation and they're complex. So I'm going to read from the stream, put it into a temp table, do something on it, and then put it into the final table, you will be in for a surprise. In Snowflake, uh, some of you might have already re, uh, figured it out, all DDLs immediately commit any active transaction. So the moment you execute a DDL and temporary table is a DD, a creation of temporary table is a DDL, it will immediately commit the transaction and you will have nothing in the stream left for you to process. All right, so let's talk about uh, dynamic approach. In case of, uh, I, I, I should mention in traditional approach, if you did it, for one source, one target table, and it works fantastic, sure, good. Now do it again for 99 more tables. I would quit, I will go home. I don't wanna do that, it's just not in my nature. Uh, that's, that's the programmer in me telling me. Uh, if I have solved a problem once, I don't want to code the same, same thing again. If the code looks similar, I cannot write it again, right? Now, there are tools which will allow you to generate that SQL. And of course, you can use those tools. And I already mentioned we had reasons to build our own. So what we did is we used Snowflake's programming capability. Did I mention JavaScript? Yes, the JavaScript store procedure capability. And we created our own mechanism to generate those SQLs from a template we have created, right? So one time you have to write your pipeline logic, whether you write it over a period of few hours, few days or few months, you have to write it. Once you have done it for source A target, any more source and target in the same pattern. Pattern is the keyword here. If the pattern is different, that pipeline is no good. So one of the key principles to follow, and we did follow, is we are sticklers for the pattern. And uh, there are different da data modeling methodologies out there. We're not going to get into the debate of Kimball versus Data Vault and why it should be versus uh, at all. But we did use Data Vault uh, for storage, not for presentation. Uh, we, we know uh, how Data Vault query performance uh, can suck. So uh, we, we, we are totally uh, aware of that, but that's not the uh, discussion we are having here. Imagine you have a data, a model that is very pattern-based, which is what a data vault is, and you can make Kimball also uh, uh, very pattern-based. What would be the characteristic of a pattern-based data model? Naming convention. 
the shape in which you are keeping the data. Like, uh, does your surrogate key always follow a certain naming convention? Does your uh, uh, primary key always have a certain number of columns? Right? How do you distinguish key columns uh, from uh, rest of the business data? So as long as you are following a certain pattern, you are able to reuse your pipeline logic again and again, as long as you can generate those merge statements dynamically. That's what uh, we did, and we will talk about uh, that a, a little bit, how we did it. But the concept makes sense, right? We are trying to generate that merge statement dynamically so that I don't have to write it 99 more times uh, after I have written it one, one time. Okay, again, we are not very creative with the naming. We called it SQL macro. Um, we could have called it SQL template, or uh, we could have uh, given some fancy uh, Greek mythology name, uh, Augustus One. Man, I should uh, come up with names like that. What we do is, once we have a merge statement, it could be 10 lines long, or it could be few hundred lines long. Uh, why would a merge statement be few, few hundred lines long? Because I cannot use temp table. So if I can't use temp table to do my intermediate steps, what option do I have? CTs, right? So uh, you can't create temp table because you're going to wipe the stream down. So you have to create the CTs. There are a few other techniques, but we chose the CTs as our intermediate steps, right? So if our transformation is 10 step long, we have 10 CTs in there. And then the final merge statement, which will either insert the rows or update the rows, uh, depending on whether those rows are already present or not. All right. So once you have written that giant merge statement or even a small one, you can look for what portions of that uh, needs to be replaced. And then you capture those as metadata in some metadata table. And when it is time to execute the pipeline, you go to that metadata, uh, that metadata table, pick up the relevant metadata, apply them to the SQL macro, and you have a SQL statement that you can execute. If you have multiple of those to execute, don't forget to do the begin channel and then the commit at the end if you are using a store proc in the task. As long as you stick to those things, you are creating a store proc that begins the transaction, generates one or more dynamic SQL, executes them in the transaction, and then commits or rollback at the end, you have pretty much a dynamic pipeline. All right. Too much talking. Let's... Uh, Let's get into this, and uh, if the interest is there, we can probably see a sample of this. So I tried to color code it a little bit. You see the things with funny symbols that doesn't look like a SQL? It's just our imagination to use, uh, to, to use them as placeholders, right? So if I wrote a simple merge statement like this, things that will change 99 more times are my source table name, potentially the source database and the schema as well. Um, my target uh, uh, target table name, so that's uh, 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 that should be uh, merge into. And, uh, and the source is hub source sitting in the middle. Now, you will see some variations. There are placeholders with at, some placeholders with hash. What's going on here? Uh, the at are direct placement, like... Uh, there is a text value to uh, plop in there. But the hash is nesting. That in that place, I might have one line, a select star, or I might have 100 lines of SQL with 10 CTs in them. As long as it is acting like a table or a view or a select query on a table or a view, rest of the things will work. Does that kind of makes sense, right? The merge statement doesn't care where we are getting the data from, as long as the data is coming with the expected set of columns and expected grain, all right? So 
how do somebody come up with something like this? The, the, the trick that works for us is you write more than one of those initially at least, and you look for the pattern between them, what stays same, what is changing, and that will give you a clue for what you need to convert into placeholders. And once you have converted them into the placeholders, you should be able to store this in your metadata table and run a store procedure in JavaScript uh, to, uh, you know what, actually, uh, uh, we started with JavaScript stored procedure. We got to the point where now we do it in UDF, uh, recursive UDF. Uh, so we don't uh, even use um, uh, JavaScript uh, so much to convert uh, this into a, a SQL. All right. Now, some of this is what we did. We don't want to claim that this is the only way to do it. You can probably find uh, even uh, easier way to do it. We definitely went through a couple of iteration. We started with a JavaScript procedure which was really long until we discovered the power of recursive uh, UDFs. Uh, recursive UDFs is powerful but comes with certain pitfalls, so watch out for that. I'll, I'll, I'll probably talk about one in the tip section. But before uh, we get there, one key point uh, I have not mentioned yet is information schema. If we put the column name in our... SQL macro, it is not a macro anymore, right? Uh, it, it, it becomes specific to a single table. Certain column names, well-known column names, uh, maybe your uh, every table probably have a metadata column like timestamp, too. those can be fixed and you should keep it consistent across all the tables for your own sanity. But rest of the business data columns, we get it from the information schema. All right, uh, information schema again behaves a little bit different from some of the databases you may have worked uh, with. Information schema is local to each database, so that can create sometimes some challenges, some confusion, so just keep that in mind and you can figure that later. Array ag is another uh, function. If you haven't looked into, look into it and that will come handy because you're dealing with collection of columns, uh, representing that as a string uh, is a way to work with it. Uh, but in an array has some advantages, so array ag will be your uh, friend there. To be more specific, if I played that statement in my mind, I think uh, there will be more on that. Information schema, when you are querying the columns table, all the columns are coming as rows, right? Uh, so you need them together. Array ag is your friend. That's how I should have said it. All right, the next part is um, you can do it in JavaScript. We finally ended up doing uh, using recursion. When doing the recursion, if you are getting unexpected results, uh, before you create the ticket snowflake, check if you are giving explicit column, uh, explicit aliens to your select column or not. I'm gonna leave that there. Uh, we got burnt badly. We created the ticket before the ticket got uh, inspected by snowflake. We were able to figure it out, but uh, that's a lesson we learned, so I wanted to share with that. All right, so we saw a macro. When I materialize that macro, look something like this. I do have some dot, dot, dot in there for the, uh, you know, for shortening it. But the blue placeholders, which were beginning with the add symbol, has been replaced with the actual values. The green one, which was supposed to be some SQL expression, uh, is uh, replaced as well. Now, if you notice, in the green one, there are some blue. So, you can get fat, you can nest, with, you can uh, have macros with placeholders in there in them. So, depending on your use case, you can get fancy, you can keep it simple. Uh, so, all those uh, are possible. If, if you do it right, you're not writing extra code, you're reusing the same code again and again. All right. So, that's all I wanted to cover uh, about the dynamic line and some of the folks who probably already uh, watched in the keynotes and all, there is a new feature called dynamic tables, which is declarative way of defining your pipeline, then why do we even need the dynamic pipeline, right? So that's uh, that's the question. We were part of the private preview of dynamic tables. We would like to claim that we were one of the voices uh, screaming for uh, something like dynamic table after we uh, tried to realize view and gave up on it. Uh, so uh, dynamic table, we are really excited and uh, it will change how people uh, create pipelines uh, significantly. 
there are use cases when dynamic table is suitable there are use cases when streams and task are uh, suitable stream and task uh, as somebody uh, uh, in yesterday's keynote uh, said is imperative way of defining your pipeline dynamic table is a declarative way of uh, defining um, uh, uh, the data pipeline um, there will be places when you want to use one over the other there will be places where it will be a, a big confusion and you will have to use your judgment i'm going to try to cover some of the uh, some of the lessons we learned and how we decide when to use dynamic table and when to use streams and task and when we are using streams and task we use our dynamic pipeline in there so some of the benefits of dynamic table uh, guess what it behind the scene doing the work of creating the stream and task that's how i imagine it uh, it's not a snowflake uh, official uh, uh, statement uh, they take care of create they take care of what for what you would have created a stream and for what you would have created a task um by uh, by making sure that they are looking uh, the the dynamic table is listening for changes to the source tables and based on your configuration the dynamic table periodically refreshes itself you are not writing merge statement guess what you are writing a simple select statement it figures out the merge statement it needs to execute or delete statement or insert statement it does support both full and incremental Uh, update and this is this is where the decision most of the time will become uh, impactful if it is doing full refresh every time it may not be desirable for use cases where you are working millions of rows or petabytes of data and so on incremental refresh uh, is what is the key strength uh, of dynamic table and if you are not able to achieve the incremental refresh because you may be using certain construct like a union or a window function or a fairly complex uh, uh, transformation logic that is the time to pause and see maybe this is the right use case for stream and task uh, why stream and task will work potentially better again our experience we know our data model like nobody else right we know that our data model is up and only we do not delete rows dynamic table cannot make that assumption right it has to make sure that the data in the dynamic table is accurate so it has to assume every possible scenarios because you know your own data model you will be able to cut certain corners in your stream and task pipeline which you cannot do in the dynamic table right some of the limitations um i uh, already talked about the third one but uh, uh user defined uh, uh warehouse is what uh, you have to use so what is serverless task it allows you to run your task using a warehouse that is already always running behind the uh, behind the scene right and the benefit is you pay by second rather than minimum of 1 minute if you work it up So if your pipeline finishes well within a minute serverless task is your friend all right that is not available yet in dynamic table i am guessing it's just a matter of time it will become available that's my guess not a official statement again so that's something to keep in mind uh with task and stream you get to use the serverless task and uh, transaction boundary is another important aspect for us if i want to do a begin uh, transaction run five merge statements and then commit it if all five of them have successfully completed i can do that in a store proc and if i wrote a store proc i need to use a stream and task i cannot use a store proc in a dynamic table something we uh, we found out during a private preview is we were worried hey we are setting dynamic table uh, lag to one minute uh, will it charge us uh, every minute uh, uh, what we figured out is uh, the warehouse doesn't get uh, woken up uh, if there is no change to process so that's the observation we had all right which is which is a great thing right otherwise uh, you will be very afraid of setting it uh, to uh, a, a low value the that was the bonus material we knew dynamic table is going to get announced so we put put in few slides it's not a easy decision all the time sometimes it will be really easy decision when you should use your uh, custom pipeline versus uh, dynamic table sometimes it won't be that easy uh, but you will have to discover yourself all right 
that's all I wanted to cover in the presentation, but I wanted to show you uh, one quick uh, uh, snippet of uh, what the pipeline generated dynamically uh, could look like. Some can be really simple. We saw the simple one up there, but this is something fairly complex and that will probably put it in, in perspective. This is line number one of the merge statement and I'm gonna scroll really fast through all the CTs in the middle. And all the green text you saw, those comments did come through the macro. Uh, so I did not write them. Oh, uh, the original author wrote, wrote them at the initial time. So when macro generates those, so now your debugging is also simple. When you log this statement somewhere and, and, and somebody's trying to debug it, they can see what SQL got generated and what comments were in there as well. This is what line number 394. So close to 400, uh, 400 lines uh, in this macro logic. And th this is trying to take the data through a bunch of uh, steps and then finally doing the insert. So if you see all these uh, column names, these column names, uh, some of those are well-known column names. Uh, so they are part of uh, hard-coded in the macro. Some of them are not well-known column names. That means they are business column names. Uh, they are generated uh, by using information schema and placed in here. That is an example. Uh, and uh, this, you don't necessarily have to go this sophisticated. There is an, uh, an, an example, uh, depending on your need. Um, I'm gonna show a view definition and we'll see uh, if, if anybody, uh, anybody had tried this capability which is built in. This is, this is a view statement. Inside that, inside that view statement, do you see this select statement? Does that look funny? If anybody is curious, what is the thing after the from? That's a cool feature of Snowflake. You don't have to put the table name. You can put a placeholder in there and that placeholder is going to be determining what table or view or a stream you're gonna query at runtime. It allows you to create a view like this. The reason I'm emphasizing on this, this is where we got the idea of creating our own macros. We use this, but this didn't meet all our need. It, you can use that for column names, you can use that for uh, from clause, but you cannot use it in where clause and so on. There are certain limitations for identifier function, right? But that's the genesis of everything because we have little time, I wanted to show this. If your needs are simple, this will meet. And you don't have to get all fancy with JavaScript uh, and macro and th those. This will probably meet your simplistic needs. Uh, and I can show you how, how that works. So for example, I'm setting a session variable here, which is to a table. And I can show what uh, the values are. So there are some variables in here. There is something buried in here, data source, and it is called mart.shopping list. All right, data source, mart.shopping list. Now I'm gonna select from that view and I got four rows, all right? From that view, I selected from the view. This is the name of the view. Cool, now I'm gonna switch the variable value. Oops. Okay, and I'm not executing any DDL statement. I'm just gonna execute the same select statement again. Came back with one row. That one row is sitting in a stream, which is the name of that, uh, which is now the value for that variable. Let me show that variable again. Data source is now a stream. And that stream has only one row right now because before that presentation, I set it up by inserting a new row into the table. So you can play with uh, the identifier and you can uh, use identifier in the select uh, condition as well, but for one column at a time. Once you get comfortable with this, you can then 
see where you need to go from there by building something custom on top of it. I think I I used everything I needed to share with you guys. Hopefully this was useful. Uh, it's if it sounds scary, uh, it did to us too. We just kept at it and we did one step at a time and we were able to come up with uh, a solution that is live in production. Our clients are happy. We are happy. I did not have to write those 99 more uh, merge statements and I went home happy. All right. Thank you guys for listening.